The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a man uncovers the truth. Archaeologists hold the fate of mankind in their hands, and a surgeon sets out for Mars. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshairad. This week, we bring you part two of Sean Patrick Hazlett's discussion with M.A. Rothman and D.J. Butler about D.J. Butler and M.A. Rothman's new novel, Time Trials. If you haven't checked out part one, go to Bain.com and give it a listen or a watch. But first, the news. The March hardcover and trade paperbacks have come roaring into bookstores everywhere. Let's take a look. First up is Into the Vortex by Charles E. Gannon. Exiled from his homeland for proving that there are irreconcilable contradictions between magic and physics, Druiden nevertheless remains determined to uncover the truth of the world, which might only be gained by traveling beyond it. But there's a catch because the mysterious portal he must use only allows a single person to pass through. Druidin must leave his companions behind. Unfortunately, the portal only works one way, and Druidin is lost to his companions. So his friends, led by stalwart swordsman Ahern, resolve to find another means by which they can retrieve Druidin, and with him, the truth of the world. Next up, we have Time Trials, the subject of last week and this week's podcast interview. Retired Egyptologist Marty Cohen has left the world of academia behind and opened a woodworking shop. But when an eccentric financier makes him an offer he can't refuse, he finds himself, along with a ragtag team of archaeologists studying texts that may be the earliest Egypt has produced. But the texts open doors to an astonishing journey. Marty and his team find themselves in proto-historic North Africa, a drying land dominated by monsters, where humanity is badly in need of champions. And behind the war against the monster overlords lies a greater struggle. Marty and his team have been chosen to be champions of all Earth and to run a gauntlet on humanity's behalf. Failure will mean extinction. And finally, The Moon in the Desert by Robert E. Hampson. Glenn Armstrong Shepard had his sights set on going to Mars as a flight surgeon, but a training accident on the moon left him crippled. Now he has a new plan, to be fitted with bionic prosthetics and come back even stronger. Fate and the Space Force have other plans, and Glenn is grounded. Another doctor, his ex fiancee takes his place, and Glenn will have to fight to prove he can be an astronaut once more. Also coming out in trade paperback is Witchy Eye. Now folks may remember that this is DJ Butler's first entry in the Witchy War series, which came out back in 2017 in hardcover. Well, the book did so well that we ran out of copies, and so we're bringing it back in a second edition as a trade paperback. Sarah Calhoun, a 15-year-old with a natural talent for hexing and one bad eye, has her world turned on its head when a Yankee wizard priest tries to kidnap her. Sarah fights back with the aid of a mysterious monk named Thalanese, who is one of the not-quite-human firstborn. It is Thalanese who reveals to Sarah a secret heritage she never dreamed could be hers. Now, on a desperate quest, she is hunted by the Emperor's bodyguard of elite dragoons, as well as by darker things, shape-shifting mockers and undead lazars. If Sarah cannot claim her heritage, it may mean the end of her her family, and the world where she is just beginning to find her place. And that's it for the news. So uh, the band of adventurers that end up uh, taking part in the novel have very different skills obtained through a lot of varied experiences, uh, some of which are direct uh, immediate help, while other skills are more obscurely helpful. Uh, despite their diverse backgrounds, our heroes managed to get along in pursuit of their collective survival 
without without quite abandoning who they are as individuals uh, at any point. Um, is this band of disparate people model on any groups you have come into contact with, or is their ability to overcome their own prejudices in pursuit of a greater goal, a, a kind of a hope for outcome of cross-cultural contact? I think that was part of some of the fun of putting this together, because if you imagine, if you, if, if you're putting together, let's say an A team, you know, from a military sense, you know, if you're putting together a, a team that's going to go behind the lines, you know, some special forces team, they, they're composed of various different MLSs, they're different elements, and um, each with their own specialty. So, you know, I think when we looked at this, we looked at it, you know, and, and going back to the gamelet thing of like D&D type background, when you're putting together a party, you you don't want everybody to be the glass cannon, you know. You 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 need a tank. You need this. You need that. You know, you need these different roles. So that you know that that that's kind of how this sh was shaped up to be, and 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 all their disparate you know backgrounds helped to form you know some of the tension up front because it, it, it's not going to just be Brady Bunch right up front, you know, we're at, not, not everybody's going to get along or, or there's going to be personalities vying for certain places that maybe they don't belong or, you know, or there's a, a con contest for it. So, so it, I think it, it helps as part of the, you know, description of the, just the, you, you know, yeah, I repeat for the third time, the human condition. So, um, you know, when, when, when you get a bunch of different people, they're they're, they're not all going to get along right away. So they need to learn how to work as a team. Yeah, I think I think that um, to some extent, having those different um, cultural backgrounds um, is a way of getting different skills and different ideas and into a dialogue and into uh, kind of playing the game uh one of uh actually one of my favorite moments i have many this is like the third time i've said this today i think uh, another thing i love uh there's a there's a moment when marty and francois are talking about sort of some of the devastation they're seeing and uh and uh and francois quotes the hebrew bible to marty and i was like well that you know that's like that's that's cool. I, I like that yeah. moment, right? right. Um, and uh, to sort of talk about, you know, what 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 do we do now? Um, I, I also think there's a, um, you know, Mike and I are both experienced in the semiconductor manufacturing industry, and another piece of my background is kind of international finance, and I think actually it's multi multinational teams are just very common right it's like that's just frankly part of my professional experience for the last 20 years it just feels realistic to me um there that there'd be you know a guy in india and somebody from australia and somebody you know right. from egypt you know um so so that may not even have been like i just i'm not sure we ever even talked about that i think that was just a thing that that's how it was yeah and that's the funny thing is that you know uh, you know we see so much nowadays on media and whatnot about you know you know identities and this and that and Dave and I never had this conversation because you know our 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 backgrounds and our you know lived experiences are you know it's like we're we're used to having teams that are just all over the place you know so um you know so, so someone might accuse us of cherry picking, you know, you know, here's a person from Australia, here's a person from India, here's a person from, you know, Germany. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, it, what's unusual about that? You know, and, and, and yeah, at least for us, the, the authors of the story, it's not unusual. So, yeah, it, it reflects our lived experience. Yeah. It also felt right for like a black markets not the wrong not the right word but kind of for an archaeology group flying slightly under the radar yeah. right yeah it's not going to be some university's team it's going to be a guy here and a yep 
gal over there yeah. holding together. Cool. So the characters of time trials are presented with a number of impossibilities that challenge accepted theories of what happened in our own ancient past. Uh, one character, and I will avoid spoilers here, believes this to be the result of alien interference or presence right from square one. Uh, I've always thought some aspects of that idea were very thought-provoking with prehistoric eras allowing for an explanation of the Fermi paradox where, you know, why haven't we come into contact with them yet? Uh, well, maybe we did in our ancient history. We just don't know. Um, is this a theory you entertain yourselves or was it just cool fun to put in the book? So, so for, for me, I, I mean, I, I'm a big, you know, almost all my books, I always have a giant looming question of what if. Um, and, and, you know, certainly lots of times in our ancient history, or even not that ancient history, uh, but certainly ancient Egypt, ha you know, you know, if, if we want to call a conspiracy theory, uh, you know, a giant what if, you know, for whatever the topic is, you know, ancient Egypt is full of them, you know, how the pyramids get built and all this other stuff get built and, you know, where did they get the technology so much different and or advanced compared to other parts of the world. So, you know, there's lots of stuff to play with there. So, um, and, and again, you know, bringing in that science background, yeah, I mean, you know, people don't think about it, but, you know, there was lots of science back in even ancient Egypt that applied or, you know, people had invented certain things. And, you know, so there was cutting edge. It's just different cutting edge than what we experience today. And, you know, and, and I drop hints, you know, here and there, um, you know, where, where, you know, it's like, you know, where we, we we have a scene that you know you, you you're you're getting something from a point of view that isn't present in the team right. and it only happens i think twice in the book but it, it it does serve as a backdrop to make people you know it, it gives people enough of a clue especially the thr thriller readers going wait a minute what's going on <laughs> yeah, there's something more than what we're you know yeah this was a hint i don't know what the hint means i, I i'm not sure what's going on but more will be revealed i'm i'm assuming and um, all along we'll, we'll take you on the ride yeah and and, and, that, and that's also sort of where our prequel came came about where you know we we, we have a, a short story written that's associated with time trials called rise of the administrator where 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 we do talk a little bit more about some of those unique little elements that um yeah 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 it's actually in that anthology um so and, yeah and, and, and so you know there there's a lot more to the story than what meets the eye so you know or at least that's the intent you're cool you know every uh Every, every historical paradigm, just like every paradigm in uh, any other science, is just what academics tend to think today based on the data we've got and the questions we're asking. And those always change, right? right. And by the way, they they change in history they change even without new data sometimes people just come up with a different set of questions and you go oh actually if we reconsider this document right um but but in i mean in history actually i think i may, maybe maybe these days more than in fundamental science in history we're getting new data all the time uh at a, at a very rapid rate we have technologies that let us do things like underwater and underground archaeology right where we can we can use, uh, you know, LIDAR and whatever, sonar, ground-penetrating sensors to find where we need to dig, right? And, um, and we're making discoveries like Gobekli Tepe or uh, Karahan Tepe, which are dramatically pushing back. They're, they're, they're emphasizing for us something we have known but maybe not thought very hard about, which is, hey, humans before us have had exactly the same brain we do for a hundred thousand years, they were as smart as us, right? Were they really just sitting around scratching themselves until suddenly, you know, 4,000 BCE, someone 
you know, put a rope around a horse? Right. Or is it possible that they also were doing math and astronomy and architecture, right? And so I, I, yeah, so I, I think it's a mistake to count early man out. He's as smart as you. I think, I think, um, I don't believe uh, that, for example, early Egyptian writing evolved. I think, I think some genius said, hey, you know what? You know what? If we draw pictures to represent the syllables, look at that. I can represent speech in drawings on the wall. And so we go from like the very simple idea of like, okay, here's a picture of a, you know, whatever, you know, a, a picture Water of buffalo. wine to show that there's wine inside this, this vase, right? This amphora to bam, here are the annals of King Catfish, right? And that was a genius. And, and so I think it is a, I think it is a mistake to, you, 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 you don't shout down the, the apparent crazies, you let them talk, and sometimes they turn out to be right. Yeah. And, going, and going with that, I mean, we, we have scenes in the book where, you know, a, a lot of this book is set in, you know, you know, somewhat early, early ancient Egypt, you know, uh, and, and we have scenes where we depict, you know, we, we, we depict, you know, ruins of people from before. So it, it's like, uh, imagine the ancient Egyptians looking at it and going, we don't know who these people were, but they were doing some amazing stuff. And, you know, and it's hid hidden in this valley, you know, and, and so, you know, like what they've said, you know, for the last 100,000 years, we, we've fundamentally had the same basic capabilities to think, evolve, you know, come up with things. Yeah. Sometimes inventions are gained and and lost to time and sometimes you know you know we build on top of stuff and you know and, and when stuff started getting written down is when we really started to build on stuff because we could figure out what happened a couple of generations ago and 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 build from there yeah i, I can't remember there was uh, uh where it was in the roman empire i think it was in italy but or the the boot uh they had the the water mill that was like seven water mills and steps with retaining ponds in each of them. Like it was the equivalent of a, a massive factory uh, for, uh, I think it was grist. It wasn't a fuller mill or something like that. It was actually a grist mill, but um, it just, uh, you know, and nobody knew about it. Right. And, and yet here's this uh, established technology so well established that they were able to build uh, basically on the equivalent of a 1940s uh, electrified uh, factory to produce uh, ground grain. It was just uh, very impressive. And it was forgotten by us because we didn't know, right? We uh, hadn't done the research on it. And Romans had very reasonable highways and pathways, you know, for uh, through much of Europe, even up in, in, into England. Well, you know. hundreds of years. Yeah. Well, there's still, yeah. there, I mean, the UK, uh, I think it's the M1 or whatever that goes north to south. It's it's built on a Roman road. Yeah. Uh, for a large and, portion of them. And we have things like the Antikythera machine, which we, we don't really know what it does. Yeah. Right? Except uh, we're still trying to make complex. Out. Right. This complex piece of machinery uh, pulled up from the, the Black Sea. So, yeah. So uh, getting on to that, there's the many ruins and historic places introduced in time trials. Uh, and I had the impression one or both of you had possibly walked some of those regions and lands covered in the book. Uh, have either of you spent time in North Africa generally or in Egypt? I, I I've been there, but not not from an uh, like I I visited the Great Pyramids and uh, so so I, I've seen the area and uh, I mean I've been to many places around the world so I've seen lots of different uh, things firsthand but um, not all the places and, and and remember what you know or at least in this setting we're postulating a time. You know, because everyone has this vision of North Africa being this arid climate. And, you know, around the time that we're talking about, it was in a, you know, the, fr from a climate perspective, it was changing. You know, it, it wasn't always arid. So they, they, they're, they're in the midst of a climate change, so to speak, where they're seeing things that were lush, you know, valleys 
getting drier and you know so so they're seeing as something that we take for granted so yeah that's one of the things that people don't you know like uh lebanon's flag has got the cypress on it yeah yeah and i, I don't know that you can find many many cypress now but it used to be the timber uh, land for all the way up until the ottoman era right uh, yeah absolutely how about you dave i've never been which is which is uh sort of appalling to me i don't know how i got to this age i've never been to israel i uh, i've never been to egypt i spent many years studying languages of both countries for example and their histories i've never been to greece either i don't know what's wrong with me griffin i i've i've, I've failed yeah, in i think life. you have a rich interior life i think that's what's I, going do you know believe it or not that's like exactly uh, one of the things my wife said to me when we were dating i think you have a rich interior life <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I can't remember why she said that, but I'm going to tell her that you just echoed her 30 years later. Well, it it is, you know, if you're exploring your your headspace and you can be there with the good history or the good fiction book like Time Trials, it, you don't necessarily need to go to breathe it yourself. So yeah. uh, having been to Egypt, uh, I really dug the scenes that were set uh, on the, uh, the basically the southern part of Egypt. Uh, it was, I was impressed and I, uh, I recommend it to my friends. I have a friend who's in Alexandria, uh, and so I, I'm going to recommend it to him too. So hopefully he'll get a chance to read it and see what he thinks. Um, cool. so how do you, re uh, prepare then for, uh, writing these sections? Cause, uh, there's a lot of, uh, following the land and living off the land, uh, and that kind of thing in, in time trials. So uh, what did you do to prepare for it? Uh... Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Sometimes it takes uh, a little time to figure out like if, whether a tree species that you want to include is there now or was likely to have been there now. Um, I mean, actually, there's a there's a time trials. As of when we're recording this, there's a time trials tie in short story that just went live on the Bain website, like I think yesterday. And I, I was, uh, you know, I, it, it starts with the sort of a quail and the image of a quail. And, and I had to go confirm that, you know, there are quail in North Africa yeah. <laughs> and that they behave that the, the way the quail in Utah do. <laughs> the answer seems to be yes. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah. So a, I live in a in, I mean, I've lived in uh, and experienced enough sort of arid chaparral mountains canyons, right? To some extent, for example, in the sequence where uh, Marty and the others go go kind of down into the canyons to deal with um, the uh, the Sethians who are oppressing the people of a Huskai village. Like to some extent, in my head, inevitably, what I'm seeing there is the the geology of southern utah right um there's probably just no way around that but then you sort of tr try to question yourself right? right if i'm going to put a rock or a plant um so I spent a lot of time on google trying to like figure out you know what melons or flowers or grasses uh yeah would would yeah. make sense is is there flint there? You know, can you find flint? You know, you know. I mean, it, all all the things that are you know, I, I, I'm you know, I think we both are you know, sticklers for detail. So you know, assume nothing. You know, because on me, unless and neither of us are an expert in the area. Yeah, you know, just because I've I've visited doesn't mean I I know anything about it. Yeah, much I mean, less five thousand years ago. Uh, so it, it's yeah. It, 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 it is a benefit of our being in the modern world 2023 that allows us to do some of this research very easily. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, writing a book like this 30 years ago would have been a lot harder. Or you just make a lot, take a lot uh, or make terrible mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've read books like that where they just have that zero idea of the geography of London, right? Right, right? Or how New York works or whatever, because they were just, they'd seen a TV show about New York and they were using that to write the novel. <laughs> right. 
or yeah, the, 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 my favorite is you know, San Francisco. The yeah. Bullet is awesome. But if you think that all those things are contiguous for that pursuit, they are not. <laughs> Correct. Or that all of San Francisco is those hills. With, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's always interesting because one of the things like with plant life, even like, so I don't know if either, you know, this, but dandelions aren't native to North America. Well, I didn't know that. Where do they come from? Europe. They were brought over with grain stores and basically cattle crapped them out. And, yeah. and uh, it's, you know, so that talk about a harbinger. If you're a, a 15th century uh, uh, Native American, right? you see these rabbits chowing down on this plant you've never seen before. No one in your family has seen before. No one in your tribe has seen before. Right. That's the harbinger of doom right there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so yeah. yeah that's, that's interesting. That's a story idea right there, Griffin. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> If only I had time, right? Um, so uh, the level of detail you go into regarding the cultures and people of time trials is also impressive. Uh, why set it up in uh, prehistoric North Africa? So because a lot of it, and it's kind of obvious from the book cover itself that you know the, the ancient Egypt is, is involved. So uh, in my mind, why the setting was because it's something you know again I, I look at things from a you know as wide an audience as possible you know and and if we're going to go into an you know for, for for lack of a better term an alt history type of you know trajectory everyone who reads pretty much is aware of ancient Egypt and the pharaohs and stuff like that. So, so knowing that that's the setting, even if, you know, maybe the pyramids aren't even up yet, you know, but it, it gives people a grounding that they can relate to, you know, it's kind of like, what you know, it's the difficulty of, you know, and, and why um, it's sometimes harder for people to read certain genres because they, they have no, you know, like if it's a totally foreign land and a foreign alien life forms or whatever, some people have difficulty reading things that they don't have a grounding for, you know. So, so you know, that's that's not a knock against the reader. Just some people aren't like that. So, you know, setting it into you know things where people can have mental visuals of king tut or whatever you know even though that's thousand years later uh you know thousands of years later um it makes it easier i think for the reader to consume there's there's a i think that is all that is all true and excellent right uh egypt is very iconic it's like elizabethan england right like everyone has right or wrong ideas about what they think that looks like right um all of us are to some extent wrong, of course. <laughs> uh, another another piece, you know, one of the things, like as Mike sort of presented this to me, was uh, one of the, sort of the things he really wanted was Narmer. There are reasons he wanted to put Narmer in there. And, and Narmer is a really interesting guy historically about whom we don't know as much as we would love to know. So it's interesting to kind of put him in there. Um, but another one of the things Mike wanted to put in very early on is a rock formation called the Jebel Mudawar which is a very cool rock formation um, on the other side of North Africa. And right. so we said, well, okay, you know, this, this story sounds in many genres. One of the genres that it sounds in is epic fantasy. So that's okay, right? Because epic fantasy, like the classic, the classic story structure of epic fantasy is the, is the journey, right? Is the right. quest. So, okay, this is, is going to be a quest, you know, from the Jebel Mudawar to, to Narmer um, across North Africa. And then we start to think about, okay, what do we think, you know, based on what we can figure out, based on what we know about human beings and, you know, you know what's, what's a plausible kind of picture of some kinds of uh, North African um, societies that might have existed, you know, and... Uh, uh, obviously a whole bunch of that detail has to be invented. Um, but of course, one reason to invent it is, um, there's, uh, there's, is the old country music songwriting wisdom 
that the way you access the universals is by uh, identifying the particulars. You don't yeah. say, well, I'm sad. You say, my wife left me and my truck is broke, right? Um, so we had to come up with, you know, figure out or come up with the, the my wife left me and the truck is broke for North Africa of 5,000 years ago. Very cool. So uh, there's plenty of desperate action in time trials against varied opposition. Sometimes it's just uh, it's thinking adversaries or uh, wildlife, sometimes simply the harsh environment of deserts and wastes. Uh, did you map out or choreograph some of these action sequences before committing them to the page? Uh, I mean, I think we knew what we wanted to do, but this is where Dave really came in with, you know, so, so some of his, you know, or I'm going to assert, you know, whether he agrees, that's a separate issue, but, you know, uh, I, I'm going to assert that from his epic fantasy background, um, you know, the, you know, I, I write things very short and, you know, to the point and very fast paced things which, um, you know, like on some early drafts of certain scenes, it's like, Dave's like, no, 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 this is the guy, we're gonna lengthen it, <laughs> we gotta ma make it more epic, you know, which, I, you know, uh, agreed. Um, and, and it's just, you know, so, so for me, you know, like the choreography of the fight, we knew what, what was gonna happen. Um, and then it was just, you know, for me, a learning experience on some of the mechanics of doing it in, in a style that wasn't, traditional thriller but more in the style of an epic fantasy battle where an epic fantasy battle may may last a couple chapters you know it's like it may be this drawn out or a whole book very... <laughs> yeah 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 exactly so so that that was somewhat foreign to me you know and, and it was like you know so you know so, so we knew what we were going to do but the details you know were, were negotiated yeah yeah, I think I think most, especially early, um, a lot of the shorter action sequences, you know, one of us wrote or the other, and so in their outline, we just said, you know, there's an encounter with the first Sethian here. They fight. Here's how Marty kills it. He gets lucky, but doesn't realize he's getting lucky, right? Okay, but then you know that was a scene that Mike wrote. Um, occasionally, we had to choreograph if. Uh, so we we each wrote half the chapters, right? And uh, Mike kind of at a about a third of the way through, maybe sort of assigned out, said, "Here's you know, you do these chapters, I'll do these chapters." And occasionally there were sort of breaks where the break was in in an extended sequence, and we had to make sure the handoff basically worked. And so we right. choreographed that a little more tightly. But like especially where the choreography matters is in the end, right? Because to Mike's earlier point, the the final battle extends over something like three chapters, um, and also uh, several different subplots have to feed into um, to feed into the into the resolution of the main plot. So you have to get, you know, uh, Loana and the lightning strike is kind of one subplot, right? But another subplot is francois's inventions uh and right. we also had to, another subplot is narmer and his health and another subplot is narmer's army right and tying it all together right. there were all these pieces and so that's the part we had to kind of talk most about and think most about it and move and and you know how does how does it all and i'm very happy way it all ended that's the piece that i think required the most choreography well, I, I certainly enjoyed it, uh, Dan. On a personal note, I hope you're already hard at work on the next book in the series. Uh, any chance of a date for that, uh, when that book might land on shelves? Uh, we we don't have one yet, but we hope to talk to Tony about that soon. And I, I think the assumption is that something like a year from when we have that conversation with Tony would be our hope. Yeah. So, uh, penultimate question, uh, what, aside from its considerable entertainment value, do you hope readers will carry with them long after reading Time Trials? For me, since one of my goals of this was to bring a new audience into genres that they may not have normally picked up, 
you know, like for instance, you know, I think arguably people when they finish reading time trials would consider it, you know, literally somewhere in in the mishmash of an alternate history fantasy science fiction type of thriller. <laughs> I mean, it's it sounds bizarre, but it's probably a fair characterization. And I think many of the audience that you know wouldn't normally have picked it up would be more open to it. Um, you know, things like that. So so for me, I want readers to read more. You know, so uh, attracting upfront readers that might be, you know, and, and there are lots of them, thriller readers, yeah, thriller oh, yeah. genre readers. Yeah. I want to bring those people into the fold that normally wouldn't have picked up such a book. And then so at, at the end of time trials, you know, one, we would hopefully want them to pick up book two when that comes out, but also be open to, you know what, I just read something that was kind of fantasy-esque or, or alt history-esque. Maybe, you know, maybe I should go pick up, you know, one of those genres and see if that floats my boat. Very cool. You, Dave? You know, I don't, um, I ordinarily try not to say political things. I'm going to say a political thing, a, lo a little political. This should not be political, but I think in today's climate, it sort of is. Um, Everything's political. Climate. that's what the marxists say that everything is political yeah so i'll take them at their word for a moment um i think i think one of the things that mike and i both fundamentally uh believe uh is that humankind has a feature a future i think we're both pro-human i think we're in favor of people and i think um that's that's sort of the long arc here especially if you read kind of the rise of the administrator to get a little more of the backstory right this is you know are, are, is humanity worth it should humanity be saved can you know should humanity have a future and i think i think the the sad truth is you know my children are all in school somewhere between high school and university right now and i think they're being told by many voices that the answer to that question is no that we are the destructive species, the only species who does this to other people or to other species or does that or whatever. And uh, I think one of the sort of soft, subtle themes of time trials is that humanity is a constructive species, that we, that we build things, that we build cultures and we build civilizations and we build trade networks and we help each other. And I think that... Um, that uh that that's sort of built into the long arc of the series also and so i hope people come away feeling like um uh f feeling hopeful you know feeling uh not just entertained but feeling upbeat about humanity very cool so last question which conventions can your find your fans hope to catch up with you and what other work do you have in the pipeline for your fans to read well, mine is going to be very simple. Uh, so I'll, I'll be, uh, so I'm not doing much traveling uh, this year. So I'll actually be for 2023, I'll, I'll be in Vegas in November at the 20 books conference. Um, and, uh, and other than that, uh, we've got a couple of books that are uh, currently scheduled to, to roll out, you know, th th things in some of my thriller genre, as well as, um, Hopefully, a you know uh, some some new hard sci-fi that uh, I haven't announced yet, but will soon. Cool, Dave. That's very cool, Mike. Um, yeah. Let's see. So for cons, I will be at Liberty Con. Um, I uh, should be at Dragon Con. I should be at uh, Twenty Books. And I don't believe I'm forgetting anything. I think that's uh, I've I've already I've already done a couple shows this uh, year so far, but I think that's all I've got planned. I guess uh, Fanex is likely. We'll we'll see. There's a couple things going on there, including a new track director for the writing track, and we'll we'll see if the the new Pharaoh knows Joseph or not. Um, but uh, so. Yeah, those are the shows I'll be at. My next release is the second um, of the Tales of Indrajit and Fix called Between Princesses and Other Jobs comes out in July. That's sword and sorcery about uh, two guys trying to make their wits by or make their living by their swords and their wits in a big corrupt old city. 
um, and uh, and then and then uh, uh, actually there's a third book coming out next year in that series. But I pro we may see the second time trials before then, or some other not yet announced projects of mine coming out. We'll see. Cool. So this has been Griffin Barber in conversation with uh, M. A. Rothman and D. D. J. Butler, authors of Time Trials, forthcoming from Bain Books. Thank you for being with us today, Mike and Dave. Thank you. Here. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. The last page flicked from the screen of Johnny's comm board, and with a snort he flicked off the instrument and tossed it onto the next seat. Across from him, Halloran looked up from his own comm board. Well, not a single argument that could hold vacuum in space, Johnny growled. We can answer all the problems Darl raises without resorting to a Cobra assembly line. But your solutions come from an Aventine syndic, while his come from a Dominion Comité. You got it. Sighing, Johnny gazed out the aircar window at the lush Aventine landscape below. I don't think I've got a hope in hell of pushing a no vote through unless we can identify the Spine Leopard killer fast. I'm not sure what that'll accomplish, actually, Halloran said, tapping his comm board. If the stuff in here on Spine Leopards isn't exaggerated, you may well need a Cobra assembly line to fight its killer. Johnny remained silent a long moment, wondering whether he should give Halloran the rest of it. At best, his suspicions were slanderous. At worst, they could possibly be construed as treason. Has it occurred to you, he said at last, how remarkably handy the timing has worked out for Darl? Here he is, pushing us to accept a permanent Cobra presence here, and he's barely landed when this mysterious super-predator suddenly decides to pop up. He couldn't have found a better argument for his side if he'd manufactured it himself. Halloran's eyebrows rose. Are you implying he did manufacture it? Johnny shook his head slowly. No, of course not. Probably not. But I still can't get over the timing. Halloran shrugged. That part of Dawa District's undergoing a pretty severe drought right now, with the Kaskia branch of the Ojanti River dried up and all. Could that have hurt the Gantua's food supply to the point where they'd risk taking on a spine leopard? Not a chance. Gantua's are pure herbivores with no meat-eating capability at all. There are a couple of that type of pseudo-omnivore here, but they're far too small to bother even a sick spine leopard. Then maybe the drought drove some other creature down from the mountains, Halloran persisted. I'm keying on the drought, you see, because that's also an unusual occurrence, at least in the occupied areas of Aventine. And you think Darl's visit just happened to coincide with our first drought, Johnny said almost reluctantly. Well, maybe. But I still don't like it. Again, Halloran shrugged. I'll be happy to keep the possibility of foul play in mind, he said. But until and unless we come up with something approaching hard evidence, we ought to keep such thoughts to ourselves. In other words, he thought Johnny was making a dangerously big deal out of nothing, and he was probably right. Still, fifteen minutes later, they landed at the village of Pelin. A visiting syndic generally called for a minor official fuss, or at the very least, the welcoming presence of the local mayor. But Johnny had called ahead with explicit instructions to the contrary and as he and Halloran left the air car, they found a lone man waiting. Syndic Moreau, he said. I'm Niles Keir, resident Cobra. Johnny nodded acknowledgement and indicated Halloran. This is Callie Halloran, your soon-to-be teammate here. What have you got on the dead spine leopard? Not much more than we had yesterday, Keir admitted, leading them toward an open car parked at the edge of the field. The experts are still studying it up at Niparan, but haven't come to any conclusions yet. 
You're the one who found it, right? Kier nodded. I was out doing a water survey when I spotted the carcass lying in a small hollow. Water survey? Halloran put in. You were hauling a sounder around by yourself? Here you just measure the diameters of the glue vines that climb around some of the trees, Johnny explained absently. It gives you a direct reading of the soil moisture and an indirect indication of where the water table is. Any tracks around it? The ground was pretty badly torn up, Kier said as they got into the car. I spotted some marks nearby that looked like gantua tracks, but if they were, the thing was either huge or running faster than any I've ever heard of. From the tapes I've seen, I can't see any reason a gantua should ever bother to run, Halloran commented. Johnny nodded. As big as elephants, their bodies armored with snake-patterned horny plates, gantuas were the closest thing to living tanks he'd ever seen. A dignified trot is about as close as they get, he told Halloran uneasily. If this thing scared a gantua enough to make it run, we are in trouble. Let's go to the spot, Niles, and poke around a little. I gather you didn't do much exploring at the time. No, Kier said as he turned the car and headed west. His tone sounded more than a little defensive. I thought my immediate duty lay in sounding the alarm, and in not leaving Palin defenseless. Johnny nodded grimly. It was a rationale he well remembered. And logical though it was, he knew how cowardly it could make a cobra feel. Perhaps Kier would get the chance later to redeem himself. They left the car at a section of reasonably dense forest at village's edge and headed into the trees on foot. The forest gave way barely a hundred meters later into a tree-dotted grassland which was the norm for the Kaskia Valley as a whole. Johnny looked around, feeling strangely more exposed and vulnerable than he ever had in the thicker woods back at Ariel. Which way? he asked Kier, fighting the urge to whisper. Uh, over there, I think. It's near a... Shh! Halloran hissed suddenly. All three men went instantly rigid, and in the silence Johnny's auditory enhancers picked up a strange rustling of grass and a quiet snuffling snort. Turning his head slowly, he located the sound, beyond a wide stand of blusser reeds. Kier had placed it too. Catching Johnny's eye, he pointed and gave a thumbs-up sign. Johnny nodded. Gesturing to Halloran, he moved a few meters to the side and raised his hands in laser-ready position. Halloran did likewise, and Kier jumped. The twenty-meter reconnaissance jump had usually been considered too dangerous to use during the war, leaving the Cobra as it did in a helpless ballistic trajectory for a shade over four seconds. On Aventine, with no troughed gunners around, the trick was often more useful. Gantua, Kier said as he hit the ground. Knee servos taking the impact. Looked sort of sick. And with a crash of breaking blussa, the brown-gray monster appeared across the plain. And charged. Scatter, Johnny snapped, his own feet digging into the ground as he sprinted in the general direction of a tall cyprene. He would never have believed a gantua could move so fast. Veering like a hill on legs, the creature shifted to an intercept course. Johnny picked up his own speed raising his hands as he did so to send twin bursts of laser fire at the gantua's head. Other flickers of light, he noted, were playing about its side, but if the creature was bothered it gave no sign. Johnny's target tree was seeming less and less likely to be a place of real safety, but on the other hand, if he could get the gantua to blast full tilt into it, the impact should at least stun the beast. Shifting his attention back and forth, he adjusted his speed, and a bare instant ahead of his pursuer, he leaped high into the cyprene's branches, and lost his grip completely as the tree swayed violently in time with a thunderous crash from below. The programmed cobra reflexes included a cat-like maneuver for righting oneself in midair, but Johnny was far too close to the ground for it to be effective. He landed off balance, crashing down onto his left shoulder blade, the impact driving most of the air out of his lungs. For several seconds he just lay there fighting to clear away the spots twinkling in front of his eyes. By the time he was able to force himself to his knees, the gantua had managed to halt its charge and was wheeling around for a second try. From behind Johnny, two spears of light lanced out to catch the beast's head, the other cobra's anti-armor lasers, and this time the gantua noticed the attack enough to emit a bellow in response. But it kept coming. Johnny climbed shakily to his feet, still struggling to get his wind back. He was still too weak to move, 
but somewhere along here his nanocomputer should recognize the danger and get him out of the way. And abruptly he was hurled in a flat dive to the side. Rolling back to his feet, he turned just in time to see Halloran and Keir launch their attack. For something that spur of the moment, it was as tight a maneuver as Johnny had ever seen. Halloran, waving his arms and shouting to attract the Gantua, waited until the last second before leaping to the right, his raised left leg raking the Gantua's side with anti-armor laser fire as it swept past. At the same moment, Keir leaped over the beast, directing his own anti-armor blast at the juncture of head and body. Again the creature bellowed, and this time Johnny could see a line of blackened plates when it turned. But even as it paused, he could see its sides pumping rhythmically as it regained its wind, and the barely visible eyes sweeping the three cobras showed no sign of either fear or imminent death. Pulling his phone from his belt, Johnny keyed for local broadcast. Hold your fire, he murmured into it, as across the plain Halloran and Keir fumbled out their own phones. We're not going to kill it by brute force alone. What the hell is that thing made of? Halloran asked tightly. That blast would have taken out a troughed APC. Gantua plates are highly ablative, Keir told him. The cloud of vaporized material scatters all but the first couple of milliseconds of beam, and the damn things are thick, too. Johnny, Syndic, we're going to have to call Capitalia and see if anyone up there's got a rocket launcher. Even if they did, it'd take too long to get it here. Johnny shook his head. If the Gantua bolts, we could lose it for good. We go for headshots, then? Halloran asked. Take a long time to kill it that way, Kier said doubtfully. Gantua's central nervous systems are a lot more decentralized than anything you're probably used to. Underbelly and heart lung would be a better target. Only if we can get it to roll over, Johnny pointed out. The Gantua's panting, he noticed uneasily, was already slowing down. Another minute or two and it would be ready to either attack or flee. His eyes flicked around the plane, looking for inspiration, fell on a glue-vine-wrapped cyprene. Miles, that tree to your left has a long glue-vine on it. See if you can ease over and cut us a good length of it. Moving carefully, attention on the Gantua, Keir glided toward the tree. Callie, Johnny continued, when Niles gets the glue-vine free, he's going to toss you one end. Don't touch the cut part. It'll stick like crazy to you. You two will hold it stretched between you at about knee height, and I'll try and attract the Gantua into it. Clear? Clear, Halloran acknowledged. Do we slice the vine open in the middle with fingertip lasers? If we have time, Kier told him. Otherwise we'll just have to hope the impact will open enough of the skin to release the glue. Kier was at the tree now, judging with his hands the best places to cut the vine. What happens if it charges one of us instead of you? Halloran asked. Johnny was almost in position now between the other cobras and perhaps fifty meters behind them. Wait as long as you can, then throw your end of the vine at its legs and jump, he said. Niles? Ready. Keir took an audible breath. Okay, Callie, look sharp. And with twin flashes of laser fire, the vine came loose. The light, or Keir's sudden movements, triggered the Gantua. With a hoarse roar, it lumbered forward. Johnny yelled at it, waving his arms, and the creature changed direction toward him. At the bottom of his peripheral vision, Johnny saw the vine snake over to Halloran, erupt with laser sparkle along much of its length, go rigid just above the grass. The Gantua hit it full tilt, and with a crash that shook the area like a minor earthquake, it slammed headlong to the ground. Down, but not out. Even as Johnny raced toward it, the creature rolled to its side, tree trunk legs straining against the vine wrapped around them. Lousy leverage or not, the vine was already showing signs of strain. This would have to be done fast. As he raised his anti-armor laser, Johnny abruptly realized the Gantua's legs were blocking his intended target. Uh-oh, Kier muttered as he and Halloran joined Johnny. We may have outsmarted ourselves on that one. Let's try wrapping more glue vine around it, Halloran suggested. Maybe we can take it alive. Taking a berserk Gantua alive is not my idea of a solution, Johnny told him. There isn't a facility within a hundred kilometers for a quiet one, let alone this beast. He gritted his teeth. Okay, there's one more thing we can try. Callie, when I give the word, cut the vine between its front legs. Niles, you and I'll see what we can do in the half second or so we'll have. If it doesn't work, scatter and we'll try to come up with something else. Ready? Okay, Callie. Now. The vine disintegrated in a flicker of light. 
and the gantua's legs, straining against it, flew wide apart to expose its abdomen. Afterward, Johnny would shudder at the risk none of them had quite known they were taking. The gantua's underbelly was relatively unprotected, the two anti-armor lasers firing their deadly blasts at point-blank range, and still the creature was able to struggle nearly to its feet before they finally penetrated to a vital spot. Even then, its death convulsions nearly caught Kier, saved only by a combination of luck and programmed reflexes. Halloran summed it up for all of them when the Gantua finally lay still. Good God, those things are built tough. I don't remember ever hearing of anyone killing one before, Johnny said. And now I know why. I sure hope he was a rogue, Kier agreed, rubbing his shin where the creature's death throes had touched it. If they've all gone crazy, we'll have to evacuate half of Dawa District alone. Or get a whole lot of new cobras, Johnny muttered. Ignoring Halloran's suddenly thoughtful look, he pulled out his phone. Governor General Zhu had the pained look of a man caught between two opposing but equally valid requirements. But the vote has already been taken, he said. Comité Darl's people are already unloading their equipment. So negate the vote on the grounds of new evidence, Johnny argued, staring hard at the other through the phone screen. He'd borrowed the Naparan mayor's office specifically for the use of the vision attachment, but so far the face-to-face -face advantage hadn't gained him a thing. Or on the grounds that neither I nor the syndics of Palatine and Celian were present. Come on, Jew. This vote wasn't even supposed to be taken for a week or so. The others were ready to vote. What was I supposed to do? Anyway, you and the other two missing syndics wouldn't have made a difference. The vote was eleven to five, and even with your cobra's double vote, the end result would have wound up the same. And as for new evidence, all you've said so far merely reinforces the decision. If one or more gantuas have gone crazy, we certainly are going to need more cobras to defend ourselves. Doesn't that depend on why they went crazy? Zhu's eyes narrowed. What does that mean? I don't know. Yet. The scientific people are just starting a biochemical study of the Gantua we killed to see if there are any foreign substances in its system. Foreign substances? Moro, it strikes me you're being unnecessarily mysterious. What, in plain language, are you driving at? Johnny took a deep breath. I'm not being mysterious. I simply don't know anything for certain. I have... suspicions, but I'd rather not air them without proof. Zhu studied his face for a long minute. All right, he said at last. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call another council meeting for tomorrow morning at ten. Ostensibly, it'll be so you can describe your battle with the Gantua and present the scientific team's preliminary data. If you have whatever proof you seem to expect, we'll listen to your accusations or whatever then. And if it seems warranted, I'll call for a new vote. If. Is that satisfactory? Yes, sir, Johnny nodded. Good. Ten tomorrow, then. Goodbye. For a moment, Johnny stared at the blank screen, trying to form his strategy for the meeting. But there were still too many unknowns. Giving up, he flicked on the phone again and called home. Chris answered on the second ring. Hi, she said, the slight tension lines leaving her face as she saw him. How are things going? Slow at the moment, he told her. I'm just sitting around the parent waiting for the scientific types to give us something solid to use. Callie went back to Paline with Niles for the night, in case something else happens there. Though there aren't a lot of approaches to the village even a crazed Gantua could get through. That helps. Chris nodded. Is Niles' leg okay? Oh, sure. Bruised, but I'm sure he's had worse. She smiled faintly. Listen, Johnny. About a half hour ago we got a call from Capitalia. It was your brother Jamie. So Darl had brought him along. Well, how was he? Fine, he said. He wanted to know if you and Gwen could meet him at about eleven tonight for a late supper. Johnny grinned. Imagine Jamie Moreau, late of Cedar Lake Horizon, casually inviting relatives to fly two thousand kilometers for a meal. Life on Asgard had affected him all right. What did Gwen say? She said sure. Made me promise to call you in plenty of time, and hopped an air car for Capitalia. On my syndic's authority, I presume— he looked at his watch, two hours before he'd have to leave. Well, he could always have the Gantua data phoned to him in Capitalia if it wasn't ready before then. Okay, he told Chris. You want to try and scare up a short-notice sitter for Corwin and join us? She shook her head. 
Jamie already asked me that, but I think this one should be for Moreau's only. I'll get to meet him before he leaves Aventine. Oh, Gwen suggested you meet at the restaurant we took Callie and her to yesterday. Sounds good. He grimaced. This is some vacation for you, isn't it? I'm sorry. Don't worry about me, she said softly. You just be careful yourself. I will. Love you, Chris. Love you, Johnny. Say hi to Jamie for me. He broke the connection and again glanced at his watch. Two hours. And nothing he could do to help with the Gantua autopsy. And whatever they found would not in and of itself be proof that Darl was behind it all. But at least a part of that proof might still be available. Heading outside, he picked up his air car and flew back down to Palin. It was getting dark by the time he and Halloran returned to the place where they'd killed the Gantua. But with their vision and auditory enhancers, it was unlikely even a spine leopard could sneak up on them. Still, the events of the afternoon had left Johnny a bit jumpy, and he was glad their task took only a few minutes. An hour and a half later, he was flying over the starlit landscape toward Capitalia, with information that would turn the ill-considered council vote on its ear. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks, as always, to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to M.A. Rothman and D.J. Butler, and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirerod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.